This feels not too dissimilar from being in a television studio. Welcome back uh, for the third session of, uh, of the ANU Energy Update uh, 2021. Um, uh, last session of the Energy Update, but of course followed by the solar oration at 5.30. So please do join us, say on, um, if, you, uh, if, you, if you have the opportunity to do so. So um, we have heard in the first two sessions quite a lot about technology, technological solutions, Solutions, technological pathways. Also a little bit about the, about the economics of the uh, zero emissions energy transition that, that can occur. Um, and in this session, we're going to look more at some social science and indeed social uh, and societal issues um, of, uh, of energy transition. And so we're going to cast the net quite widely in that regard. And we're also going to ask the question, what research is needed, will be needed, to inform um, policy decisions, community decisions, business decisions um, in Australia's uh, energy uh, transition. Uh, we have three speakers in, uh, in this session. First speaker will be uh, Dr. Bruce Godfrey. Um, I'll introduce Bruce in a second. Uh, second speaker will be Dr. Amanda Cahill uh, of the Next Economy. And the third speaker will be our colleague from the ANU, Beck Colvin from uh, Crawford School. Dr. Colvin. Um, so, without further ado, uh, it's, uh, it's over uh, to Bruce Godfrey. Uh, Bruce is a fellow of the Academy of Technology and Engineering. He's director and vice president uh, for diversity of the Academy, as well as chair uh, of the Academy's Energy Forum. Uh, he has chaired expert working groups of the Australian Council of Learned Academies, a COLA, uh, on delivering sustainable urban mobility and on energy energy storage, uh, and his career has been built in business, innovation, investment, and technology uh, development. Um, and one thing that uh, I think we will hear from Bruce about is the Australian Energy Transition Research Plan, uh, which, which we consider a very important document indeed. Over to you, Bruce. Thanks, Frank. I'm just sharing my screen. And, and hopefully everybody can see that. So um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk about the uh, COLA's uh, development of an Australian Energy Transition Research Plan. Um, as you can see there underneath, it's all about a strategic research agenda. Uh, to enable Australia sustainable, reliable, affordable and fair energy transition. Let me first explain a little bit about a COLA because you can see uh, down the bottom that there are three logos I have there. Wild Group is uh, my company. Um, a COLA, of course, the Australian Council of Learned Academies and um, ATSI, of which I am a fellow. Um, so a COLA is, uh, is uh, if you like, has, a, it's not above the Learned Academies, but it is uh, the Australian Council of Learned Academies, and uh, it brings together the five academies, now five academies, uh, with the inclusion of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences, brings together the five academies to uh, really do interdisciplinary projects uh, and because it's not that often that uh, coming from ATSI, for example, uh, that technologists really interact as well as they should with the HASS uh, side of uh, the social sciences, humanities and social sciences. Um, so a COLA really is able to draw on the network of the academies, uh, bringing together uh, evidence-based reports for policymakers and governments to hopefully give aid them to make informed decisions. Um, it's Academy ACOA uh, has done a lot of work in the past uh, for various um, chief scientists uh, and continues to support um, projects such as this one. What's the background to the um, to the plan? We know that the energy transition is, is well underway in Australia. 
but clearly further efforts are required to transform our industries. Um, that's, that's very clear in a technical sense, uh, in an economic sense, but also to support the fact that we've, we have a broader socioeconomic change uh, is going to be required for a successful transition. Um, you know, now, now at least the uh, net zero by 2050 is the destination. Uh, but the critical questions are how are we going to get there and at what rate? Um, IEA has already understood that the technologies exist today for substantial decarbonisation by 2030. So it's, uh, you know, we, we can deploy a lot of technologies today and the policies to drive that deployment have already largely been proven, whether or not it's, um, whether or not it's supporting uh, projects to get on the ground, whether or not it's feed-in tariffs, whether or not it's uh, um, things like um, uh, price on carbon, they've all been done, we know those policies. But post-2030, how are we going to continue to, to get there, to reach net zero? Well, it's going to require further innovation and in R&D, um, and we're going to have to accelerate emerging technologies to market. So this is very much around this idea of of accelerating both innovation and R&D and then those emerging technologies to market. Because if we don't get the emerging technologies to market, we don't make impact. Uh, the IEA also has very importantly reiterated that the energy transition to net zero is for people and about people. But you know what the evidence is in Australia and based on experience of the steering committee members, uh, for this project, there's been limited research really into the social and human elements of the transition up to date. So with that in mind, it was recognised there really is a need for more strategic, coordinated research efforts here in Australia. This project was uh, initiated and, and has been led by and remains led by Drew Clark. Uh, Drew is a fellow of the Academy of technology and engineering, but also um, has been in uh, very senior roles in the Commonwealth Government. Uh, and so he, at the end of 2019 and early 2020, with Ecola, did a big consultation with right across the energy sector on the idea of this research plan. And a number of conclusions came out of that. Yes, we do collectively perform pretty well in energy research, at least across the science and technology aspects of energy research. We've got many, many very well-known groups that do world-class research across a wide range of energy technologies. But there is currently no national framework to ensure that the efforts are being directed towards the most urgent or critical issues, or indeed to ensure avoidance of unnecessary duplication. Now, of course, Australia does, you know, two to three percent of the world's research. Uh, so we need to be able to tap into international developments and those developments will in undoubtedly inform our national uh, plans. But we do need more local research to solve problems, not only that are uniquely Australian, but also that where Australia has particular competitive advantages that we can exploit. Uh, of course, going back to this theme of a successful transition, it's got to address the energy trilemma, but it also has to be fair. So that means that all actors uh, need to progress efforts in a manner that really reflects the urgency and the scale of this challenge. And in particular, out of that consultation came the need to look at options to increase efficiencies in the way in which research is funded and undertaken here in Australia. So as a response to these critical issues, uh, COLA and the steering committee uh, have been working over the past two years to develop this first uh, Australian Energy Transition Research Plan, which was launched um, in June this year. You can see the members of the committee there. It's uh, chaired by Drew, uh, Sue Richardson, uh, myself, uh, Libby Robin, Ken Baldwin, who many of you will know, and Fran Baum. Fran, Fran is from the Health and Medical Sciences Academy. 
So we are in come. We're truly taking what a cola offers to to think about the the tra- the energy transition and research to support that right across the social science, the the has side of things, as well as the physical and engineering sciences side of things. This is really we came down to three themes um, in developing. Uh, the the plan and the three things as you can see represented on the screen hopefully it's um, clear enough to you um, came the three things came around energy system dynamics uh, social engagement dynamics and transition dynamics so let me just go into a little more detail on each of those in energy system dynamics we we felt that the three key topics within those, uh, within that theme, are around policy regulation. We, you know, research is required on the policy and regulation aspects of the transition uh, to ensure that we do actually have uh, best practice uh, here in place. Um, In particular, we felt that further work is needed to consider how our future industries are going to be regulated all industries are regulated to greater and lesser degrees. We need to understand how our future industries, like, for example, hydrogen, are going to be regulated. And I know that at ANU, for example, uh, that is an area that has been looked at and is continued to have work done there, but I'm sure there's a lot more around the country. Communication and engagement. We have to effectively engage on the impacts of the transition. That's essential. We already have enough examples where um, effective engagement on the impacts, positive and negative, is simply not happening at political levels, at community levels, with lots of misunderstandings occurring. Um, So a successful transition is going to need effective communication, genuine engagement, Um, community support and consumer, prosumer and investor confidence. And that investor confidence is one that we can never lose sight of, but we can equally never lose sight of genuine engagement to get community support. Without community support, many things for the transition will be delayed or simply just take, uh, will never happen. So further research on how we can achieve best practice engagement and communication is certainly going to help. Uh, that comment there about minimising divides of politi- politics and rhetoric, how much do we that, of that do we still see today? And then the social licence and participation, the concept of justice, equity, fairness, health, wellbeing should really, has to apply across social and geographic contexts and we need to better understand perspectives and values so that we can facilitate genuine collaboration and participation at all scales and across all sectors. Transition dynamics. Transition dynamics. Um, Technology, self-explanatory, of course. Australia needs to continue to invest and drive research in technology Um, R&D. That's for us is just simply self-obvious. Why do we do that? We need to continue to drive down costs and encourage uptake of current technologies and the theme again of bringing emerging technologies to market. Transition pathways, uh, there are currently multiple uh, pathways, techno-social pathways that Australia can take. Um, There's many views about what those pathways are at political levels and at and at uh, community levels. So we need to understand those. That pathway and the technology mix will evolve. What will get us to 2030 is not necessarily what will finally get us to net zero 2050. So we do require ongoing research and modelling to ensure that Australia continues down the trajectory uh, that causes the least disruption. Systems integration, we're talking about very complex systems. The energy ecosystem has got lots of interdependencies. 
there's supply chains, there's different sectors, we've got infrastructure to think about, we've got markets to think about, regulation, and last but not least, those of us who actually use the energy in all of the forms that energy is used. And to date, we feel there's not been sufficient analysis of how these systems interact with each other um, to consider wider impacts and linkages. I knew I missed one. There's one. I missed this before. Um, so, no, oh, sorry. My apology. We have gone through. So, where are we at now with the with the plan? The research briefing papers for each of the three themes are being finalised now. So we've we've got detailed um, briefing papers that are exploring the research that's currently being undertaken in Australia research gaps, what opportunities can be provided if Australia, if Australia actually does pursue research in the, key top, in the key topics for each theme. We're also finalising a research translation paper. Um, our first report that came out in, in June 21 emphasised that the research and innovation sector is going to play a critical role in what we're calling a clever pathway for Australia to reach our target. Um, and, you know, there is no doubt that we also feel there is great opportunity to uh, not only impact here in Australia, but to help reduce global emissions. How can we do that? Well, we do it in the ways that we have already done it in the case of things like solar cells, for example, through the export of Australian research breakthroughs and also by pivoting our export future towards renewable energy intensive products. An example, of course, the obvious example being um, hydrogen. There are three critical limbs uh, to pave this pathway. Appropriate prioritisation of urgent and strategic research, the funding of that priority research, and then finally, but definitely not last, the translation of that research to impact. If we can't translate the research to impact, then the research, while being useful, is never going to, to reach what it should to make the transition, to impact the transition. The obstacles that impede the flow of research to impact, um, you know, there's prioritisation and translation obviously can support the transition. There's not a lot of readily available literature on Australian energy research translation. Uh, we generally tend to, tend to use the word tra translating research in the medical field. That's well understood there. We tend not to understand it at all well across other, particularly the physical sciences fields. There is a general understanding of some of the key barriers and they are such things as appropriate funding, uh, collaboration, Translation of research to policy, engagement with users, non-academic incentives. One of the things that's also clear is that many research activities within the HAS domains face the double dilemma is that they're not sufficiently prioritised and funded and challenges are there in effectively communicating the findings to impact. So we feel that Australia's current approach to research translation is not sufficient for the urgency of the challenge. And so that is where we're coming to. The next steps, implicitly, we feel there is a need for a broader breadth of an increase in and greater coordination of Australian energy research. We do amazing amounts of Australian energy of research here in Australia into energy technologies. Um, we do it at uh, global scale, at world scale results. We recognise many groups are recognised globally. So that doesn't mean, though, that we shouldn't be doing more across broader areas. Australia, uh, sorry, COLA is undertaking further consideration and analysis of the current diversity and quantum of funding and will be presented in a separate paper to come. We do encourage researchers to engage in interdisciplinary research where possible, because this will be a particularly insightful knowledge. And some of the activities uh, it, that are underway at ANU are definitely in that interdisciplinary research. And for funders, we encourage them to utilise the priorities that COLA has identified to help ensure funding has the most impact or benefit.
Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Bruce. Uh, and the point about interdisciplinary research is in, indeed a, a very important one. Uh, that, that certainly we're, we're trying to reflect as best we can uh, in, in our work here as well. Our next speaker is uh, Amanda Carl. She's the uh, CEO of The Next Economy. Now, Amanda's work, uh, the focus of her work and of her organization is to support communities, government, industry uh, to develop a more resilient, just, and regenerative economy. Uh, Amanda is also an adjunct lecturer at the University of Queensland, industry fellow, uh, at the University of Sydney and a 2020 Churchill Fellow. She's also a uh, alumna uh, of ANU. And uh, last time I saw Amanda in person what it was at the Central Queensland uh, uh, Energy Summit, I think it was called, um, which, uh, which was a very, very um, exciting event actually that brought a whole lot of different people together to talk of s about some of the really tricky issues in energy transition. And, uh, perhaps we'll hear a little bit more about that from you, Amanda. Over to you. Thanks, Frank. And hi, everybody. I'm sorry I can't be there with you in person today. I'm calling in from the land of the Yugger and Turrbal peoples here in Brisbane and want to pay my respect to their elders, past and present, and also acknowledge that the land I'm meeting on and land around Australia has never been ceded. Um, so as Frank said, the next economy we work, um, our remit is actually broader. It's, it's working with regions around Australia to look at economic opportunities that enable people to act on climate change, regenerate natural systems, and also have socially just or well-being outcomes as well. So usually people come to us when they're in crisis and they're looking for new economic opportunities. And most of the work... Um, since we started the next economy four years ago has been looking at the energy transition because it's the biggest economic challenge a lot of places are facing. So it's been our privilege to work with groups all over Australia doing a lot of engagement. There might not be a lot of research on the engagement, but there is a lot of engagement happening. Um, and I've worked across all across Queensland, mostly in central Queensland and north Queensland, the Hunter Valley, the Tribe Valley a few years ago. And more recently in the Northern Territory, where there's some really interesting discussions happening between unions, social service organisations, First Nations and environment groups around a post-fossil fuel future for the Territory. So Frank asked me to talk about central Queensland context particular to, in particular today because it is a pretty important area um, for a few reasons, particularly in the lead up to the federal election. I'm going to focus on how the discussion and the engagement has played out um, over the last couple of years. So why is it important? Well, um, in the last federal election, it's the region where we saw some of the biggest swings against Labor. So in Queensland generally, but particularly in central Queensland. And things really hit, um, hit a peak uh, with some conflict that everyone would have seen in the news with the Bob Bound Roadshow going up to... Um, Claremont near the Carmichael, Adani Carmichael mine and were met by pro-Adani supporters and there was clashes there that led to some violence which really shocked Australia. So there's a lot of focus now on the region and lead up to the next federal election to see you know has how things changed. Are we going to see the same kind of thing playing out now? It's also important because one of the major seats there, Flynn, uh, Labor has a chance of winning. Um, and it's also the home of Matt Canavan and some politicians who are already talking about the energy transition and we are starting to see some of that divisive language again. So politically, it's, it's really important right now. But apart from that, it's also important because it's the home of four major coal-fired power plants. It's where there's a lot of um, coal mining, particularly metallurgical coal, coking coal, but also thermal coal. And it's also the home of a major industrial hub in Gladstone, where you have um, aluminum refineries, aluminium smelters, chemical plants, cement factories. So it's one of the areas that's also been identified as kind of the potential to become a renewable energy superpower. But it is proudly the carbon capital of Australia and proud of its industrial heritage. So I'm going to talk about central Queensland, not just Gladstone. So it's, it's there is Gladstone. There's also Rockhampton, Livingston, further north on the coast, Biloela, uh, where there's uh, other power plants. Also further west to Central Highlands where there's mining and an Aboriginal community of Warabinda. So it's quite a large region. 
Uh, we've been working there since 2018 and it's been interesting to see how that conversation has shifted and shifted very quickly and often pivoted com in complete opposite directions depending on what's going on. When we first started going up to the region and holding roundtables with government and industry and community forums, it was very much an education piece. People weren't talking about transition, they didn't know what it meant. The sort of attitude we were met with was, we don't need to worry about that yet, we've got plenty of time, there's going to be 50 years at least, markets of coal, um, so that's not something we have to worry about. When the tension happened around the federal, like, but people were turning up to the forums. And then with the elect last election, everything went very quiet uh, for the next nine months. The turning point was actually the bushfires in the summer of 2019, 2020. We, had, um, we actually had some forums that were funded by the state government to start talking about the energy transition. And we started to get more interesting and a more wider variety of stakeholders turning up. And what was interesting was for the first time, people were asking us what was the links between fossil fuels and climate change? And what did they need to start getting ready for that? So that was last year. As the year progressed, more and more the conversation started to appear in the, the local media. And it was focused, and the real turning point came around the discussions around hydrogen. Suddenly, people could see that there was an economic opportunity there, not just a risk to existing industries. And yet, you couldn't see that publicly conversation on the ground. It was all very much behind closed doors and a little bit in the media. So things came to head for me in December of last year, so only 12 months ago, when I was hosting a whole lot of workshops and meetings, so some with local councils, some with state government, had some meetings with unions, environment groups and industry and some of the big fossil fuel energy generators. And what was interesting over those two weeks, eight meetings over two weeks, everybody was saying exactly the same thing in, in rooms that you would think were, had, would have quite different views. And the sentiment was things are moving very fast. There's a whole lot of money to be made if we can manage this transition well, but we've got to start having a public conversation about it or we could miss those opportunities or just manage it really badly. So I spent another two weeks trying to convince everybody to start that conversation. And after a lot of frustration thought, well, if we're the common factor in all of these discussions, maybe we should host something. So we invited everyone to a summit in April of this year. And what was interesting was it was industry that were most enthusiastic about the proposal and actually put up the money to fund a discussion in central Queensland, heart of coal country, to talk about the fact that the energy system was changing. Uh, Frank was there, but um, so were a lot of other people. And what we did was we actually did what you're doing today, presented the international and national trends, and then got local stakeholders to talk about what they were actually doing that they hadn't told anyone about in terms of planning, in terms of technological advances, in terms of investments that they were making. This included the CEO of Stanwell, the third largest emitter in Australia, um, electricity generator, actually admitting that they, their strategy was to diversify their energy portfolio and that they could no longer compete with renewables in the area. What was interesting was that people in the heart of coal country didn't bat an eyelid when he made this statement, but the national press saw it differently. And two years late, two days later, he resigned from his job. And I can confirm that he did resign. He wasn't fired um, by the minister being a government owned corporation. So what was interesting about that was people in the room for the two days put their heads down and actually worked out what they need to do to manage this transition in the region. It was positive. It was people were very nervous going into the room, but they were relieved to actually just start figuring out what they needed to do. On the back of it, there was a whole lot of announcements made. We heard that Cement Australia was actually used the summit to advocate for a decarbonisation plan within their business. We've had Rio Tinto come out publicly around their decarbonisation plans for the first time. We had international investors contact the Queensland government because they'd heard about the summit and felt that there was social licence to actually start talking about funding, um, investing in the region. And in the national press, um, what was really interesting was the journalists were actually outraged by the idea that a CEO could make comments about the energy sector and lose their job, even though he did resign. We had 10 weeks of media coverage um, straight after the summit. And what was interesting was why the conversation was, why can't we talk about energy futures in this country? Why is this such a political issue? The good news is on the ground that momentum has continued. The Gladstone Regional Council has um, is now starting a planning process to come up with a 10-year 
transition roadmap that we're working with them on. And a bunch of community groups have gotten together to actually start a community-led conversation process that's a much more public and grassroots conversation process where we're training up people on the ground, leaders, to talk to others in the region about both the opportunities and the risks. So where is the conversation now? Well, we were just there on the weekend um, and people are really starting to see the opportunities. They're hearing about things like hydrogen, manufacturing, green steel, um, even potential around agriculture and land use to draw down emissions. So there's words like the potential of central Queensland to become an energy superpower, renewable superpower are starting to actually be talked about. But there are still a lot of concerns. People are worried about what um, things like coal phase down means. They've been hearing about Glasgow and also the potential for early closures, even though the government hasn't actually announced um, any plans around closures. People on the ground know that they're looking at early closures and want to know what the plan is. People are also worried about the boom. They've been through the, the gas expansion and saw that that actually could have some negative impacts on things like housing access and affordability, um, not seeing long-term economic and financial benefits flow to the region. So there's questions about, I guess, worries about what could happen with a boom around hydrogen. We're seeing water and land conflicts already starting to happen around renewable energy. And people are worried about growing competition between regions without a national or state plan. Um, people are worried that they're starting to compete with townsville for investor interest. They don't trust industry and don't feel like they can leave the planning to industry alone because of the social and environmental potential impacts on the region. Um, and they're worried about a lack of coordination. They don't believe that the new jobs are necessarily going to be good jobs. Um, and we've seen that in renewable energy already. So people are questioning that. And there's also some safety concerns starting to pop up around hydrogen and people not really understanding what hydrogen is and a lot of misinformation there. So what are people saying that they want moving forward? They want consistent policy at a national and state level. This isn't like just industry and government people saying this. This is people on the ground saying, where is the plan? Where are the targets? Who's got our back as we move forward on this? There's a lot of interest in establishing regional transition authorities to manage this. And in the meantime, councils are starting to do their own planning, but feeling very underprepared and not well funded to do it. We are seeing grassroots conversations happening that are community led. And we're going to see more of that in the lead up to the federal election. So I'm hoping that will go some way to sort of ameliorate some of the toxic politics that we might end up seeing. Um, so, and people want to see the, the government actually do their job. So it's been a really interesting discussions around um, industry saying that they need government regulation, saying that publicly, but also local councils and the public saying we actually need government to actually coordinate this but not in a top-down way, in a way that they support regional-led planning that is actually appropriate for, for where they're at. So basically what it boils down is people want to see someone take responsibility and they want it to be someone's job to help them manage this transition on the way forward. And I'm happy to answer any more questions that might come up from what I've said. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda, and uh, we'll, we'll pick up on some of these points uh, in, in, in the discussion. Uh, our third speaker is Dr. Beck Colvin, a colleague from the Crawford School of Public Policy. Uh, so if you're studying at ANU or if you're considering doing that, then you know, seek out um, Beck for sure. She's one of our most highly decorated and uh, you know, prize awarded uh, teachers as well as PhD supervisor, in fact. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, these things are public. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so Beck's research interest in particular is in how groups of people interact, um, often in conflict situations, over environment uh, and, and climate change. And in that context, I think you're going to uh, speak to us about some of your recent research in the Upper Hunter. Thank you, Frank. And hi, everybody. It's very nice to be speaking with you all today. To be honest, I'm actually feeling a little bit nervous for the talk because I've usually got the comfort of the Zoom rectangle around me. <laughs> um, but I am going to talk about some research that was done in the Upper Hunter. So a uh, master's student, Evelina, who now works with um, ICEDS, and I went to the Upper Hunter after the smoke. We got there on the day of the hailstorm in Canberra, but it was just before COVID. So it was that 
brief <laughs> window of calm in the middle of everything that's been going on. And we were speaking to people about what are their priorities for economic diversification and social well-being in the region. And of course, this is a question that's fundamentally connected with issues of energy transition. But I'll talk a little bit later about why um, this idea of energy transition may sometimes be a bit of a challenge in places like the Upper Hunter. So just to give a little bit of context, the Upper Hunter is just inland from Newcastle. There's lots of big coal mines there and there's a couple of ageing coal-fired power stations. And as Amanda was saying about um, central Queensland, the Upper Hunter sometimes gets described as being one of these areas. It's like ground zero for energy transition in Australia. So a lot of the coal that's mined in the Upper Hunter is thermal coal and a lot of it's for export. So this is a region that's not just being affected by domestic shifts around this idea of net zero, but also um, international shifts. So I'm going to talk through some of the key findings. Um, one of the first is that there's lots of valued um, industries in the region, and this includes coal. Coal is valued by many people, but coal is seen as being dominant. And if you can see, <laughs> that's why you were laughing, Will. Yeah, I thought you were laughing at me. There's a <laughs> the censored image shows the scale of the coal mines. Are they good? Are they bad? I won't say so, but they're big. If you Google, oh, there you go, you can see them. When you're in the towns, if you haven't been to this region, as I hadn't before I went to do the research, I was quite overwhelmed by the physical scale of these mines. So they're very present in the local towns. And when people talk about coal mining, they talk about how it's been important, it's supported the education of their children, it's given them employment. Um, and they talk about the contributions that the industry makes locally. So this is things like donating equipment to schools for education projects and supporting sports clubs and things like that. And so the idea of there being a threat to the future of coal doesn't just affect people who are employed directly in the industry and people who are employed in the value chains, but it's also a pretty serious thought for people who just live in the area. Because what does it mean for some of these things, the schools, the sports clubs, that are supported by donations from the industry? But one of the things around coal as well is that it's not universally loved and it's not universally hated. There's lots of people in the region who have felt that the scale of the industry, of the mining, has extended beyond what they would think is being reasonable. And the expansion was described as peaking around 2011, 2012. We had people who have worked in the industry who've benefited greatly from the sector, saying that it got to a point where they felt that the expansion of the mines had gone beyond what was appropriate for the region, and they were fearful about what they were leaving for their descendants locally. So when you talk about the future of the region, you have to talk about coal, yet the future of coal is a contentious issue. So that makes these conversations challenging. Now, another theme, and this is going to connect a fair bit with what Amanda was saying, is that we found quite a difference between what people were saying privately behind closed doors in spaces that they felt comfortable and they knew the views of the people that they were speaking to compared to their perceptions of what happens in the public debate and what they observe in the media and federal and state politics. So we had people saying to us, I don't like what's going on with the coal mining, but I know it can't shut down overnight. We've got mines that have long-term leases, we've got people who need the income, so what we want is for no new mines, no new expansions and some certainty around the limits. That was the main message that we were hearing. Meanwhile, there's other people who are saying, I think the industry has a good future, but I know it's going to come to an end at some point, and we probably need to start planning for that. Yet the perception is that these people say coal mining needs to end yesterday, and these people say coal mining's going forever, and we don't want to hear anything to the contrary. So there's this real perception gap between what people say when they've got the space to engage with the complexity of the issue, and what they expect is what people think about this issue. And that really speaks to the importance of the sorts of conversations that Amanda's been facilitating, bringing that nuance and bringing that space for exploration and cooperative exploration into the public sphere. Now, one of the other things that's interesting in the Upper Hunter is that the thoroughbred breeding sector is um, pretty important in the region. Now, it doesn't employ as many people as coal mining, but it's a big economic industry. 
And we found that there was a bit of a social fault line between people who were on the side of coal versus people who were on the side of the horses. And this is partly due to some mine expansions and mine proposals being quite publicly opposed by the thoroughbred stud breeders in the past, funding some of their legal challenges against the mines, but also their aesthetic clash. And you could probably speak to issues of culture and class as well between the mines and the horse breeding. And that's kind of, you know, interesting, whatever. But it actually has a significant impact and it's that people see anything that is an alternative to coal through the lens of seeing the thoroughbred breeding industry. So if there's this discussion about what could come after coal, what could be um, an alternative to coal, it's kind of through this lens of the zero sum battle between horses and coal in the upper hunter. And so it makes people think, well, if there's got to be something other than coal, what else have we got? We've got the horses. Well, they don't employ enough people. Most of their staff are casual. It's funding problem gambling, blah, 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 blah. All reasonable issues to raise. But it's as if it's become a mental model for what you can think of that would be alongside coal. And so this suggests that something that's important is to show what are some of these tangible um, alternative industries and perhaps alternative industries that don't need to compete with coal in the same way that the thoroughbred breeding industry has been positioned as competing with coal, but something that can grow a lot up alongside coal, at least in the short term. Now, just like Amanda, we found that people expect that government should take a leading role in the region. And a big part of this is about giving some certainty and a plan for the future. Now, there's no lack of plans <laughs> for the region, but they're not seen to be well known, they're not seen to be socially legitimate, they haven't been generated with the participation of local people. And so what the folks that we were speaking to, I probably should have said who we spoke to, we spoke to 42 local people who live in the region and we targeted people who were not already engaged in um, conversations in the public sphere. So you're quite Australian, so to speak. So they expect that government should lead such efforts, but that there should be cooperation between community and industry. So very much seeing that there's a role for everyone to be part of these conversations. Um, I mentioned about the term energy transition maybe not being always the way to have these conversations. Now, part of that is because of the divisive and toxic politics that we have in Australia, where terms like climate, coal, energy transition, net zero, can be conversation stoppers. Um, here in Canberra, that can be the case. It can be the case in the Upper Hunter, Central Queensland, wherever. But more importantly than that, when you talk to people about what matters to them for the future in terms of economic diversification and social well-being, they don't see that from the perspective of energy transition. That's the topic I'm talking about. They see it in terms of what it means to live in the region. So it's a questions about education, the future for their kids, health, well-being, opportunities. And so the energy transition, which can sometimes be the dominant frame that outsiders will take to regions like the Upper Hunter and say, how's the Upper Hunter dealing with energy transition? It's not how local people see things at all. They see energy transition as being one of many complications that need to be addressed. Now, I can still see my slides. And actually, that was the end. <laughs> so <laughs> this work comes from um, some research that we submitted to a journal for peer review and it since unfortunately has been lost in time and space. So it might be published at some point in the future, but hopefully not too much longer. The work itself um, really speaks to a whole lot of other efforts. So we went into the region for a couple of weeks and spoke with a bunch of people, yet there's lots of efforts happening. So um, Amanda's team is active in the Hunter region. There's also the Hunter Jobs Alliance, which is a really interesting organization that draws together trade unions and environmental groups who are also facilitating some of these conversations. So one of the really important things, and perhaps if there's one key message, it's about the need for conversations that can cut through those divisive politics um, that really allow people to engage beyond the catchphrases that we hear that shut us down and lock us into these adversarial positions so often. Oh, it's back up. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Well, what a wonderfully interesting yarn there, both from the Hunter uh, and from Central Queensland. Um, I think we're all online and we can all uh, hear uh, each other, which is great. 
Um, I've got that. Oh, yeah. Well, well plenty, plenty of laptops to go around. Um, all right, so we've got a few minutes for conversation. I'm very happy to take questions directly here in the room as well. We have uh, VVox open, uh, open too. Um, but let me just start to, to kick us off to, to our three uh, panelists, the question. Um, a lot of what you said, what you explained to us about energy transition challenges in communities has got to do with communication, right? And so um, in the work that, that you've done respectively, um, can you identify a single issue, a single barrier where we will make substantial progress overcoming that barrier to energy transition through dialogue, through conversation, through communication. Can you nominate one that we can, that we can address that way? Who would like to go first? Amanda. Amanda. We've decided. <laughs> so is that what, what topic, if we address that topic, that would cut through? Yeah, is that the a question? barrier to energy transition that we, can, that we can help overcome through better communication and conversation. So the thing that has been cutting through more, um, but I think when we're in these rooms, we just assume people know about, but it's still very new conversation on the ground, is the range of jobs that um, we can potentially create by building these industries that we've been talking about today. Unfortunately, still, and you'll hear it in the national politics, this idea that you know renewable energy is not, um, you can't trust it yet, what happens at night, um, and it's never going to replace the jobs in the coal industry, whether you're talking about mining or electricity generation. They're short-term jobs. They're not as well paid. Um, so we need to get past that and start talking about there's lots. This isn't actually this form of energy replacing those kinds of energy jobs. This is about what can we do if we have locally available, cheaper, renewable energy how can that actually support all sectors of the economy to diversify um, and develop in different ways? So there's the discussions around manufacturing and green steel and processing, but it's also the fact that our regions um, do a lot of manufacturing and processing in food and other, other products as well. So talking about it that way opens up people's minds to this is an opportunity to um, revitalise a lot of regional economies and, and build on strengths um, moving forward. So that's one thing. The other thing is um, I found over the years actually getting people to fact check themselves around the assumptions. Um, so in some places like Singleton, for example, in the Hunter, you're talking 40 to 50 percent of the employment is through the mines. But that's actually quite unusual in, in some of these regions that we're talking about. So actually just getting people to fact check how many people are actually employed in fossil fuels versus other industries, where, where is value being generated? to get them to analyze their own situation rather than someone from the outside telling them how it is. And I'll stop talking there. Yeah. Frank, just um, following on from Amanda, uh, I, so I can't really talk from a coldest point of view because we're talking about um, an Australian energy transition research plan. And, and one of the things that was, uh, I, as I said in my presentation, that was highlighted is we need more research around uh, the sorts of, exactly the sort of stuff that Amanda does uh, in her day-to-day -day world um, that Beck does uh, at ANU around what does matter, what are the, what are the messages, what, um, you know, this is, this is the social sciences coming in and doing exactly what they're very, what, what they can do and instead of, um, you know, businesses or politicians um, coming in or and saying, look, have we, we've got the problem solved. Let's just build hydrogen. And somebody says, well, what's hydrogen? You know, it's, it, it's that fundamental. But let me, I am going to give you just a, um, one, of, one of the roles that I have is I chair a battery company uh, called Energy Renaissance. Uh, it is located in... Oh, it's, its factory is going to be located uh, in Tomago, in the Hunter Valley. The first two, um, the first two employees in the uh, in the production plant, and at the moment we're just in a, in a temporary facility. Um, 
both electricians, both coming out of coal and power plants, both happily transitioning into um, testing, assembling, managing all of the all of the programs around how do you get how do you build batteries, test them, and get them out to uh, to customers. That, there's a living example now. It's really it's two people at the moment, but we intend it to be a lot more. And that's the sort of you know, that's a that's a real live example of what both Beck and Amanda have talked about. on the point that you asked about what is one of these barriers that we might be able to overcome. From my perspective, a really important thing is breaking down these binaries, making it okay for people to have complex mixed views, to be able to say, and actually Dr. Howard is someone who um, told this to me at some point, recognise the great benefits that coal has given us, but at the same time recognise some of the side effects that maybe aren't so good. So some of these, um, like Amanda talked about the Stop Adani campaign, some of these ways of thinking about the future that set us up in these adversarial binaries can be really difficult to then have conversations that engage with nuance, that recognise the identity that people have connected with these sectors, the history that they have. Um, so I think that's a really important aspect is breaking down some of those binaries, the polarised way that we talk about these issues and we all have um, a part to play in that, even in our, over the festive season, our awkward Christmas lunch conversations with <laughs> remote family members. Yeah. Um, very quickly, a question from the, from the chat. Sorry, Amanda, uh, maybe come in on, on this one. Um, uh, how, do, how do local people, um, think about um, the local environmental benefits of the energy transition. So with regard to um, air pollution, that was the question here on VVOX, uh, but also, of course, with, with regard to, to mine rehabilitation. Is, is that a factor in the conversations at the local level? Uh, well, I can start with that one. So it is, and air pollution is a big thing. Something I perhaps implied but neglected to mention is that for most people, in the Upper Hunter region, it's not about the coal-fired power stations, it's about the mines because they're so big. So a lot of folks feel quite distressed by air pollution, by the amenity impacts. So seeing um, hill in the distance become fundamentally different, deforested. But there are also some of these complications that people were talking about, which is feeling that the divestment movement, the decarbonisation movement, may be leading to some of the more reputable mining companies to be getting rid of their coal mines. So selling to um, tier two companies that perhaps are not gonna be as um, good with rehabilitation. Maybe they have worse safety standards on site. Maybe they don't pay the same worker entitlements are weaker. So some of these complex um, impacts were described alongside things like air pollution, which was seen to be a really important factor in the Upper Hunter. Amanda? Um, I think Beck's kind of covered what I was going to say, and I think that she's made a really important point around contradiction, like people, the same people holding what would seem to be very contradictory views in their heads. Um, and I think it was interesting, I was listening to um, one of your engineers earlier who was talking, John, John Pye, um, and it was an example of where he said, nobody knows exactly how this is going to play out yet. But the three presentations um, in that section, what they did really well was they mapped out here are the different options and here are the, some of the consequences of going down this route, both positive and negative. And I think that's the way to actually be talking to people around thinking through what is happening now that we know, what are some of the options that are being talked about moving forward and what are the advantages and disadvantages of all of these options, including continuing down a fossil fuel route, which bring in holistically the social and the environmental and the economic impacts for people in that region because they know what the impacts are better than anyone else but they've also learned to live with a lot and kind of shut some things out or put it in a in a box so by opening up all of the options without judgment or trying to push in a particular way enables people to balance these things out in a different way and, and think more creatively about it and that's how you move past the, the binary there very quickly before we go to Ken here on VVOX, this follows on. 
do uh, our speakers think that our major political parties or politicians are abreast of the changing mood and sentiments in regions like central Queensland and Hunter? Do the police have their fingers on the pulse? No? You're shaking your head. No, I'm having a lot of meetings right now. And <laughs> right. Okay. Um, I think it's, it's um, there's still this, I still get a line around po what polls say, and I'm just like, you need to get on the ground. And, but the, the thing is in different rooms, I, I found if you go into the same room of people and say, you know, do you want to protect the, the coal jobs into the future? People are going to say yes. If you say to people, do you, should we be investing more in renewable energy? The exact same people will say yes. And I think that's what's happening with the polling and it's happening when the con when different politicians are going into the room, the conversation ends up yeah. focusing on what. So I think that's that's the issue we need. Um, and I'm not sure how to cut through it, but I'm meeting with politicians of every, um, <laughs> along the spectrum at the moment, trying to actually share, share some stories of where things have, um, are starting to shift. But I think the more we can create safe spaces for very public conversations to happen, like Central Queensland Energy Future Summit, that, that got a lot of people's notice because they were like, you actually had this conversation in central Queensland. So that's where we need to be moving to. And there's great stuff going on the Hunter with the Hunter Jobs Alliance and other groups there. Bulls, can we quickly bring you in on this, on this one as well? Um, in terms of the work that uh, you and, and your colleagues at Acola have done, um, do you see um, a, a substantial need to convey um, best available knowledge on energy transition options into politics? Um, or uh, or is, is our political class already well served with, with advice from, from their departments? Oh, from, from the Ecola point of view, I think our, our work already says that um, there is a desperate need to convey into the political world whether or not we can get them to listen is a different issue. Um, that's uh, that, that's actually the biggest challenge, and and it's and I would emphasise here that it's not just when in, in the political world we're not just talking about the politicians. That is the person who got elected. They are they have a team of advisors, um, staffers, whatever, you know, however what the term is that's used, um, and they listen. Uh, in many ways, if you can influence them, you can influence the politicians' um, uh, uh, particular views. Uh, and it's also the staffers that actually have the time to read and and uh, and take the sort of data, whether it's on the ground data from such as uh, Amanda and Beck are talking about, or whether or not it, that data is presented in uh, in a learned journal. Um, you know, you've got to get the messages across. But, and also, we, we also need to remember that um, there's a lot of people who influence politicians. They're called leaders in the industry. They're called leaders in local government. They're called, um, they're called public servants, leaders in public service. Um, educating them is also part of the game. But a, a point, I just couple of things there, Frank. Um, you know, we right at the beginning of this transition. Those of us who have been in the in in the in the new energy technologies world for as long as I have, which is forty five years, we sort of think, oh, you know, this is all just normal, isn't it? Uh, you know, why 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 doesn't everybody do it? Well, that's because we we forget about that a transition is actually about two generations long. We do need to speed it up. Um, and there's not a lot of examples that people can point to. There's no, there's no sort of big hydrogen farms. Uh, there's no solar cell manufacturing plants. There's no battery manufacturing plants where people can go, oh, so that's where the future lies. I've got a real world example. You know, it's the, it's the old thing. If you can't see it, you can't be it. It's, it's part of that. That's another aspect of it, I think, as well. We're touch over time, so I think Ken's question will be the concluding one. There, there seems to be this misconception that stops the conversation moving forward, that people are going to close things down, that they're going to close down coal mines, they're going to close down coal-fired power stations, and there's a lot of energy and angst and, and actually entropy, speaking from a physics perspective, that goes into this. Um, 
Whereas if people actually realise that it was the demand that's going to close things down, because the demand's going to fall away, like the demand for VHS tapes fell away when CDs came and CD demand fell away when personal devices came along. You know, it's all about demand. It's not about Bob Brown coming in and turning off a switch or, you know, a government saying, no, sorry, we're not going to do coal anymore. Is that what is what is getting in the way of people thinking into the future? If they thought about themselves as being a VHS tape industry, maybe they'd think differently. Can I jump in there? Yeah, I was going to invite you, go Amanda. You, you, go, you go, Bex. <laughs> oh, no, I insist, Amanda, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> I feel like you're at a disadvantage and you're in the room. Um, so I, uh, I think people, particularly in the Hunter and Central Queensland, Latrobe Valley, like places at the heart of this, they know that things are changing, particularly now. Um, that's not the issue. The issue is they've seen what happens when industry closes and they, don't, they haven't seen the good examples of where it's been managed well. Apart from, I'd say, La Trobe Valley Authority was at, has been our best attempt so far and there are some new initiatives going on, but they don't know about them. And so people live in fear of, you know, the forestry industry, the car manufacturing industry. That's the example that's in people's head. What they're worried about is things closing fast and that there is no, there's nothing in place to actually manage that change. That's what I'm hearing from people, and particularly people working in coal-fired electricity plants because they know that all the plants are closing before the end of technical life, but they don't see anyone doing anything about it. So I guess just to um, add on to that, Ken, I think one of the other complications is the legacy of what's come before. So um, shifts in market and demand might persuade some people, but I think others will see no matter what happens, it will be the latest um, threat to salt of the earth coal workers by inner city greeny elites. And that will take time, but it might be that some of those perspectives are the perspectives that can dislodge it a little bit. But we did find some of the conversations we had with people, they were talking about global shifts in demand for coal, but not using those words necessarily, but still seeing that as being a consequence of kind of their caricature of the Bob Brown convoy itself. So I think there's a lot of um, social healing to be done that will probably be necessary in order to have the conversations like you're talking about. Okay, let's draw this session to a close. Please join me in thanking our speakers, Beck, Amanda, Bruce. Uh, so this concludes the Energy Update 2021. Thank you very much for taking part so actively. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we very much hope that you took something from it, whether, whether it's a bit of knowledge, some insight, a uh, couple of new contacts perhaps, or, or maybe even a little bit of extra optimism. Um, please let us know any comments. Uh, we've got uh, comment feedback forms and all such like questionnaire. That's right about the the event. So you can help us to uh, do further and better in the in the in the, in the post-COVID normal or in the COVID normal, whatever we're going to call it, in terms of how we hold events. Uh, if you're not on your ma on our mailing list, please uh, join um, the mailing list. Um, thanks very much to, to the team at ISETS who have made this possible with very hard um, work over, over quite a bit of time, especially the last few weeks since we've known that we can actually hold this in person as a hybrid event. Great stuff, guys. Um, and yeah, so with that, uh, solar oration starts in just over 20 minutes. Uh, will be a great event too. Um, and yeah. Um, more refreshments outside. More refreshments outside. Um, <laughs> and uh, also have a great summer. Goodbye.